Bruchem Aboim. We are now in the 14th lecture of the um, Haggadah, and we just finished off benching, and again, the uh, third cup. Again, the four cups, the first one's for the statement of Hotsesi, I will bring you out. The second cup was for the term of Hitzalti, I will deliver you. Goalti, I will redeem you, which is the cup that we just had. And now we pour for the fourth cup. Fourth cup will be Lakakti and take you to me as a nation. And um, now, according to the most cups, uh, most customs, what we do here is we fill the cup of Eliyahu, and uh, we open the door again to greet Eliyahu. Some people will say Baruch Haba, um, the blessed, you know, blessed He who comes. And um, what we see, we see here is that Eliyahu has to attend. Uh, as he says here that Eliyahu has to attend all circumcisions and the question is why the one was he told God that the Jews wouldn't do the ritual of circumcision again which is a covenant between a Jew and God so he has to testify and also so he can testify that all the participants are eligible to eat the Paschal offering because you can only eat the Paschal offering the carbon Pesach if you're circumcised so Mashiach will come then all the Jews will be able to eat. He'll be able to testify that these people had circumcisions. Also, they, um, when we do the fifth cup, now the fifth cup is not drunk. Um, I did see some people have a custom of pouring it out, of pouring it to, a little bit to everyone, but what most people do is they pour it back in the bottle, I'll put a little in and pour it back in. I found a nice custom. What I do is that I save it for Kiddush the next morning. And I make Kiddush on the cup of Elio. So once you start with the mitzvah, you finish it. And that's the custom that we've adopted. Um, now, the Gemara, there are questions. Why is it called the cup of Elio? Because we're not sure what to do. Do we drink it? Do we pour it out? Because it represents the last term of Hevesi and bring you to the land, which did not happen for the generation that left Egypt. They died in the desert. So there's a question of whether we drink the fifth cup. So... The Gemara, when there is, ever is a question, we don't know the answer. The Gemara ends with a term called teku. Teku is an acronym for tishbi yitaritz kashios viabayos. That tishbi elio is called elio ha tishbi. That's where he was from. And he will answer all questions and difficulties. So again, so we'll wait for elio who will herald in the coming of Mashiach to answer what we do with the fifth cup. And that's again why we call this the cup of elio. Now, it says... Um, in, um, when we open the door, generally we, we must climb the ladder of a spiritual advancement. The one step, actually one step at a time. Uh, and if we are not worthy, we are held back by the doors of the heavenly protocol. Tonight these doors are swung wide open, allowing everyone, regardless of their spiritual caliber, to skip over all the impediments and attain the highest levels of spiritual growth and closeness to God based on the, uh, the Rebbe's Haggadah. So again, so this is why the door is open as a symbol to that, of us being able to answer and enter. In fact, again, it's our prayers that open up the gates of prayer. Again, so now they're open. In the days of the temple, the doors of our homes were locked on the Seder night. The reason being so that those that were not counted on each particular group's offerings could not come in off the street and partake of it. The way the designation of the Paschal offering was you had to sign up for it on the 14th uh, in order to be, so to speak, registered. And if you weren't registered for that Paschal offering, you couldn't come into someone's house on the night of the 15th and just partake of it. So everyone had to register beforehand in order to be able to partake of it. So therefore, the doors were locked. And when the meat of the offering had been completely consumed, then the people would then unlock their doors and open them wide to make up for what they had done and give the proper honor to passerbys based on the Sfat Emes. Also, in former times, while the Seder was in progress, non-Jews would be listening outside, spying, hoping to hear something that would enable them to slander the Jews and inform upon them to the authorities. And when the Jews opened their doors wide, it would be a clear indication that they, in fact, had nothing to hide, again, based on the Sfasemis. Also, when God brought the last punishment, the plague of, on the Egyptian, which was the killing of the firstborn, the Jews remained locked behind closed doors inside their homes and were not allowed to see the downfall of their enemies. However, it says regarding the future redemption that we will be allowed to see the punishments that God meets out to our enemies, 
For then we will take his revenge, we will be able to take his, God will take his revenge in public based on his Fasemus once again. Now, according to the Medrash, Yaakovina received Esau's blessings on the night of Pesach. That's when he took the blessings when Esau went out to hunt. And he served Yitzchak, the, the two sheep. One was the Chagiga, the festive offering, and the other was the Korban Pesach, the Paschal offering. And after Yitzchak had finished eating these two, Esau opened the door. And Yaakov hid behind the open door. He was behind it and escaped through the room before Esav could notice him, based on Nachosim. So he opened the door to allow Yaakov to escape, and so he was undetected by uh, Esav. And an allusion to that. Now, we say, Shemo chamoschem ala goyim, pour your wrath onto the nations, and, not let, and do, at that they do not recognize you, and upon the kingdoms they do not evoke your name. For they have devoured Yaakov and destroyed his habitation. Pour your anger upon them, and let your fiery wrath overtake them. Pursue them with wrath and annihilate them from beneath the heavens uh, of God. Now it says, Ki ochel is Yaakov, uh, which is singular. It should say, Ki ochlu, not just one enemy, it's many. So it says they are all united in their hatred of the nation of Israel. It's amazing. What they really hate is our God. Um, it's an amazing thing that we as Jews, if a Jew decides that uh, he wants to convert, God forbid, to Christianity or Islam or some other religion, it's accepted. If a Jew just is not dimensional, uh, if he does, doesn't serve anybody, he just decides he's not going to claim he's an atheist, uh, no one bothers him. The only reason why people hate us is because we take on the term God, a Jew, which means we take on God. What they hate is not us, what they hate is God. And a person needs to know that. And it's important that we carry, we carry that banner of God, and that's why there's hatred for us. Otherwise, people have no, no problem with us whatsoever. Now, what happens now in the Seder is that we begin what is called the Egyptian hollow. And um, the Egyptian hollow begins with the word Lolanu Hashem Lolanu, that not for our sake, O oh Lord, not for our sake, but for your name's sake, give glory for the sake of your kindness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? So I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but one may ask why the hollow, again, which means praise, is split into two parts. The first part of the hollow actually speaks of the exodus, which is what we did in the beginning of the Seder before the meal, and is therefore called the Egyptian hollow. After the meal, we conclude here the hollow from Psalms 115 through 118. This is not the past, but the future. We are giving God thanks in anticipation of the redemption from the long and bitter exile in which we now live. Before the beginning of the second part of the Hallel, we recite the two verses, Shavok HaMoscha, pour out your wrath. Reason being so as not to begin our reading in the negative sense. Otherwise, we would begin Hallel with the words, Lo Lanu, not to us. And, that, and this would be improper based on Amamlois. Amamlois also says there is a general rule if someone prays for someone else and needs the exact same thing, he's answered first. In fact, we see that with uh, Abravino, that uh, Sarah got pregnant when Abravino prayed for Abimelech's household because uh, when he took her as a captive in his harem, everyone, all the openings to their body were closed, including women who were pregnant. So when he prayed for them to give birth, then Sarah was answered and she too gave birth. She became pregnant. So therefore we say not to us twice, lo lanu, Hashem lo lanu, not to us, God, not to us. The first time we simply say that God should not do it for our sake, but to prevent what we call a chil Hashem, a desecration of God's name. As it says, they're going to ask, where is God? So since we are praying for another, namely God, we deserve to be answered first. But we repeat, we repeat again, not for us a second time, as if to say, God forbid that we would resort to such a trick to be delivered. But why should the nations of the world be able to say, where is their God? It's not acceptable. So we tell God so that they can't ask, where is your God, that we're still in the exile. Let him bring the exile again as a Kiddush Hashem to show that God is in attendance. And it continues with the second part of the hollow, the next psalm, Hashem Zechonu Yavarech that uh, Hashem who remembered us will bless, that we now ask God for ourselves and ask that just as God remembered us in Egypt, 
so too she remember us in our present exile, again, based in Amam Lois. The next part of the Hallel is the Ahavti Ki Yishma Hashem, as Koli Tachem Nunoi. I love him, for Hashem hears my voice and my supplications. Now, Amam Lois says, I love God. Why? Because he hears my prayers when I seek mercy from him. No one else need listen to my prayers, for God will hear my supplication and free me from this bitter exile. In fact, we make our most fervent cry to God, our, our greatest prayer to God, Shimon Esrei, which is totally silent. The only person we want to hear, the only person that we give our supplication to is God Almighty himself, a father beseeching a child. And we have full faith. That's part of prayer is the belief that God listens and God answers. And the truth is, every prayer is answered. And a person needs to know that. Uh, people will tell you, I prayed and I wasn't answered. The answer is, yeah, you were answered. The answer may have been no or not yet. We think it's only the affirmative that we're answered, which again shows that we are really spoiled children. Continues, and then the other part of Ma Shiv Lashem called me a lie, which is again, how can I repay God for all the kindness He has done for me? Now, how can I repay God for all that good that He has done for me? We lift a cup in honor of our deliverance and mention God's name, praising him for his greatness before all the world, best on Mamlois. And it says in this psalm, Ani avdecha ben amasecha, that I am the servant, the servant of your maidservant. Now, the Sforno says this verse is the source of our practice to pray for a person with his mother's name. And we say it was called the Misha Berach, a blessing for a person who's sick, for a woman who's given birth, for anything that's a blessing. Then we use the mother's name. One is the kindness, and also there's a, um, we have a chazaka, an assumption that someone is your father. But today we have DNA, but we don't go around doing it. But we know who the mother is. There's no question about that. So both because of the kindness of a mother and also at the same fact that for sure the prayer is correct on who we're talking about. We always do a blessing in the name of the mother and the sources from here in this psalm. Then it continues in the next psalm, a two-verse psalm. Again, there are three of them in the psalms. How Lewis Hashem called Goyim. And it says that, uh, praise God all the nations, praise Him all you people for His kindness to us is overwhelming. And the truth of Hashem is eternal. Hallelujah. Now, it's interesting that uh, the question would be, the future redemption will be greater than the redemption from Egypt in yet another way, that during the exodus from Egypt, only the nation of Israel came to recognize God's greatness. Other nations did not accept or change their belief to believe in God. And they did not praise him. However, all the future redemption, however, at the future redemption, all the nations will praise God and they will see how powerful his love for us is and they will recognize that he is, that his, that his, in, he is infinitely true and good, that he is the one and only God based on the Mamloys. Now, what's interesting though, so that'd be for us to praise, but it says, how Lewis Hashem called Goyim. We're asking the, the nations of the world who do not serve God, at least not as we do as the one and only God in the way that we do, why would the nations have to thank God? And the answer is that they know all their plans and machinations that they have tried to use to destroy the nation of Israel, but have not succeeded. So they are the ones who can truly understand this fact and should praise God. We don't know. It's a famous story told of Tsar Nicholas II, who was a rabid anti-Semite. And um, he had wanted for many years to rid Russia of all of its Jews. But every time he would try to run a, a law through um, his uh, ruling body, uh, the Jews would find ways to bribe people to do this. They, the laws never got through. And he's really very frustrated. So finally, one day, being the rabbit anti Semite that he was, he gathered together all of his ministers in a room in his palace, and he sequestered them there. And he said to them, he brought them there early in the afternoon, and he said, I want you to come up with the law, ridding all of Russia of all of its Jews. And he figured that since they were there, they would come up with the law, it would be passed, the Jews could not get in the way of it in any way, and then he'd be rid of the Jews. And he said to them, they had till, till midnight. He would be back at midnight, and that he expected them to have the, the, the uh, law drawn up. 
he posted two guards at the door and he said if they did not do it, they would be executed. And about nine o'clock, the doors swing open and it just so happened that the ministers had finished early and they were, uh, didn't know what to do really, but they were waiting and they had just finished a little before nine. And at nine o'clock, the doors swung open and in comes the czar. And they greet him cordially. And they, uh, he asked if they had finished it, and they said they had. And he took it, sat down at a seat by a, a fire uh, that was there, and began reading it. And after he read it, he grunted, swore, took the papers, threw them into the fire, got up, and, and, st and, and stormed out of the uh, room. Well, the ministers were really quite confused. They didn't know what to do. So some said maybe they should leave. After all, there wasn't enough time to draft another uh, law. And they didn't know what he didn't like about the one in the first place. So they didn't know what to correct. On the other hand, he said 12 o'clock initially. So they decided in the next room there were refreshments. Find dish, find food, booze. They decided they'd wait till 12. And that's what they did. At 12 o'clock sharp, <clears throat> doors opened again and in comes the Tsar. Tsar Nicholas, uh, Nikolai says to the ministers, so where is the law I told you to draw up? And they said to him, you threw it in the fire. And he said, what? They said, you threw it in the fire. He said, I haven't been here. And they said, excuse me, your highness, but you're here at nine o'clock. And he called in the guards and he said, execute them all. You're, they're lying to me. And they said, no, we're not. Ask the guards. So he turned to the guards and he said, has anybody been in this room since I left at five o'clock? And they said, no one. No one except for you at nine o'clock. And the Tsar just looked at all everyone and he shook his head and he said, the God of the Jews, the God of the Jews. And there's so many things that happened where God has helped us and we don't even know. And that's why Lewis Hashem called Goyim, that it's the Gentiles who really can praise God because they know the truth what they tried to do to, do to us and have been able to. And so he says, Ki gavar hasto, because the strength is very strong for us. Why the word gavar? It's a strange word. And the merit of three things is with that the word gavar is an acronym for. The gimel for gemilas chasadim, that's kindness. Beis or bishanim, humility. And the race for rachamim. These three things are the traits of a Jew. And, and God bestows his kindness upon us in the form of gever because of the fact that we represent that, of these three things, of kindness, uh, humility, of bashfulness, and of mercy. Continues in the next thing, the praise, Hodu Lashem Kitob, Kilam Chasto, four verses. When we thank God for his good, and then Yom Yisrael, let God say, uh, his kindness endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his kindness endures forever. Let those who fear God say his kindness endures forever. And in a synagogue, this is done back and forth between the chazan, the per person leading, and the congregation. By the way, if there are at least three males over the age of 13, at the Seder, again, it should be said responsively, just like you would in the synagogue. Now, it's interesting that, what is this, the first one, Hod Lashem Ki Tov, praise God because he is good. That even if a person suffers, he must realize that Gamzu Latova, that everything that happens in this world is for the best, and God does not do anything that would hurt a person if he's if a person feels he's suffering, it's for a positive purpose. And the end will be he will thank God for it. The second one said Let Israel say that God is good, even today when we are in exile, we must thank God for he does many favors for us, which we are not even aware of, as I showed in the story that I mentioned before. Third line that the B'nai Aaron, the, the priests say, because the, the world is good. Uh, the house of Aaron, Kohanim, even though the temple is destroyed and they cannot enjoy their offerings, which they partook of and the gifts that were given to them while the temple stood, which allowed them to have the leisure to spend all their days in studies of Torah and worshiping God, still the Olam Chasto, still if everything is for good. And the same thing is true in the last verse, Yom Renei Hashem, let those who fear God say this. Same is true of those who fear God and spend the day and night immersed in Torah. Since they do not engage in business, they are often poor and barely have the necessities of life. Still, they must praise God and say that his love is infinite and eternal. Again, based on Mamloi's. It continues in the next, uh, when it talks about also, Ki Olam Chasto, Li Olam, 
as it says that uh, for his kindness endures forever. And also the olam also mean forever, meaning according to the alshech, can also mean olam is world. That whatever God does, he does for the benefit of the world because he himself needs nothing based on the Elias Haggadah. So everything he does, much like a parent, it's an interesting thing. The, the true giver is a parent for a child. And that's what God is, the true giver. He gives to us just like a parent gives to a child. The next next uh, portion in the hollow min ametzer karasi ka anani remarkiv ka the straits that I call off to God. God answered me with expansiveness, and um, we prayed. We pray from our own narrow perception min ametzer boundaries. Sometimes asking God for those things that are not beneficial at all. And so we ask God to give us what he knows we truly need based on the Aldous Chaim. And that's the real key. The real way to pray to God is say, give me what I need because you know better than me. You know, there's the old thing of a genie in a bottle that the person, it's a cute commercial where someone asks for a million bucks and he looks out the window and there are a million deer out on his front lawn. You know, you have to be, when you ask for something, you have to be very specific. And they need, people need the other two wishes that the genie gives them to get out of the trouble that they got with the first one. Again, when a, when a person puts himself in the hands of God, all of his blessings are perfect. And it says if in, the, in the psalm, but in the name of God, I cut them down. I mean, enemies, in the name of Hashem, I cut them down. In the name of God, again, I cut them down. That since I know, I know that God helps me, I will fear no man based on Mamloyes. A person who has faith in God, Baal Shem Tov says, dies once. A person who does not believe in God dies many deaths. It's very important. A person puts his fear, his, his trust in God, he has no fear of anything. And then we get to the famous Anashem Ashia, no, and we ask God to save us. We say that term twice, and then we ask God to make us prosperous. Again, we say that twice. And again, if there are three men, we say it responsibly, just like we do in the synagogue. And just like in Egypt, even though we didn't deserve it, the word Hoshia means that to be saved without you doing anything, not because you have any merit, versus the word um, Yazir, to help, as we do on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, we do tshuva, and then God helps us once we do. We repent. But Hoshia means even without doing anything, God saves us, much like a parent with a child. So that's why Hoshia is the term that's used here, of helping us just like in Egypt where they didn't deserve it. And also, why is it repeated twice? First for the physical salvation and second for a spiritual salvation. One would think the other way around, first spiritual and then physical. God deals with the world in a very practical way. Imein kemach in Torah. There's no flower, there's no Torah. So a person, again, needs to be a partner with God and help God by, do, by working. Six days a person needs to work. And then God brings his blessings to what a person does. Then it continues with Baruch Habah, B'Shem Hashem. Blessed are those that bless in the name of God. And then it finishes off the last Hallelujah, that uh, they shall praise God um, for all the works along with the pious followers. And then it continues with that, which we, with something called the, Psalm is called the um, Great Hollow. And so, um, again, uh, praise God because he is good. His, his goodness endures forever. The Psalm, again, is called the Great Hollow since there are 26 verses and they end with Kili Olam Chasto, for his kindness endures forever. And 26, as we know, is the gematria, the numerical value of the four-letter name of God, which we do not mention. We say Hashem, which is the name of God of mercy, based on the uh, heritage of uh, Haggadah. And um, if, you, if you ever see it in the Siddur, it has a Yud for the first ten, and then a Hay for the next five, and then a Vav for the next six, and then a Hay for the next five, to allude to the fact, again, of these 26. Now, this psalm contains 26 verses with the phrase, for his kindness is everlasting, alluding to the 26 generations that existed from Adam, from first man, to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, during which the world existed without the merit of Torah. Again, the world did not receive the Torah to the year 2448 of creation. And was sustained by the kindness of God, based on Avudraham and Gemara and Pesachim also. And now the Arizal taught that one should keep in mind that the letters of God's name of mercy while reciting this psalm based on pre eight's Chaim. Now God did not give his Torah to the world until 26 generations had passed since he created the world. 
and that he waited again for 26 generations. All those previous generations were sustained only because of his kindness, again, which endures forever. Again, the concept of olam chesed yibana, that God only, the world exists only because of God's kindness, which is a pasuk in Tehillim. A person needs to know that if you understand that point, that olam chesed yibana, the whole world exists for kindness, then whether we understand it or not, and the truth of the matter is we don't. Many times we see things and they seem to not be kind. But if you looked at a person who was in an operating room and see people with knives cutting on him and blood and, you know, it looks like a bunch of sadistic people trying to hurt someone and they're angels of mercy. Then many times what we see is really just a piece of something. And it's not the, the full truth of what the something really is. It's very important for a person to know this. And also it says, Old Nivis goes Lovado, that he does his, his wonders himself. That one of the verses in the 26, this is superfluous. God doesn't need any assistance. So what is that saying? Rather, he does his great wonders without anyone else knowing, based on the al It's very difficult. When we do something good, we want people to know. It's human nature. We like to be praised. We like to be complimented. We feel good when people say nice things about us. God doesn't need that. That whatever God does, that's why we don't understand what he does, because he doesn't need it to be praised. We praise him because we know everything he does is good. And this becomes the point that we need to always remember. Continues with the nishmas uh, kochai, that the uh, give thanks to uh, the, the whole, the soul of every living being shall bless your name. Again, which we say in the prayers every uh, on the Shabbat. And it ends with every knee shall bend to you, all who stand direct shall bow before you. And uh, these two phrases represent two different levels of divine service. Bending your knees implies a recognition of God's power. But while bending the knee, the person's eyes continue to look forward and his back remains straight, meaning he retains his own way of thinking and his personal pride. Bowing, prostrating oneself, implies surrendering oneself to an overpowering experience that totally encompasses one's being based on the Rebbe's Haggadah. So again, it's both bending the knee and bowing, complete submission to God, which is to be the easiest thing for a person to do because who are we compared to God? And then it continues with that which we say on the Shabbat, the Shochenad, the Makalos Rivervos, again, praises to God. And then the famous Yishtabach that we say every day. And in it there are 15 expressions of praise to God. And again, by praising God, what we really do is praise our relationship because, again, the servant of a king is a king. So we acknowledge our position of being the servant of God. What we really do is take on that exalted position of being godly. And that's what says, Allah the Bidrachov, to go in his ways. And by doing so, we really reach a new level of connection to God. And with that, we reach the point of the blessing of the fourth cup, which is drunk reclining to the, again, left side, which all the cups should be. And uh, now, the other cups, it's preferable for a person to at least drink what's called rove kos, the majority of the cup. If a person drinks all of it, fine. But um, even if you haven't drunk um, all of the other three cups, it's preferable for a person to drink the entire last cup of wine after, you, again, you make the blessing of our Priya Gofen and reclining to the left. Now, this last cup of wine, again, is Lakakti, to take you to me as a people, again, which, again, is the, represents the fourth cup of wine. And, um, again, the... Um, we still have the cup of Elio, as I mentioned before, which when I was a kid, we used to drink. I, I, there, I saw it once. It's very unusual. Most people do not have that custom, as I mentioned, that many people will pour some wine into it and then pour it back into the bottle. I think, again, the better custom, which I like, is to cover it and then make kiddish the next morning on that wine, starting with the midst of keeping it going. After that, we then... Uh, conclude with the bracha krona ala gefen ra priya gefen on the wine and on the fruit of the vine again which is said any time that we drink wine by itself not part of a meal we've already benched so this glass of these two glasses of wine we make the blessing over as one unit and then we finish off again the babich ends ends on this and some of the chasidim do with the with the concept of nirza nirza again being accepted according to with the verse let my tongue adhere to my palate we fail to elevate Jerusalem above, above my foremost joy. 
And we pray that our reenactment of the past redemption sets the stage for the future redemption, and that we may celebrate next year's Seder in the Holy City. So with the words, Chasal Seder Pesach, Yichol Chaso, the Seder is now concluded in accordance with its laws, with all its ordinances and statutes, and just we are privileged to arrange it so we merit to perform it. A pure one who dwells on high, raise up and countless congregations soon guide the offshoots of your plans redeemed to Zion with glad song. And again, so with this, this, this we say, L'shana haba Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And um, only twice a year um, does the nation of Israel say this prayer, L'shana haba Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem, in unison and in a loud and joyous voice now at the end of the Seder and also at the end of the holiest day of the year, the Yom Kippur, after Nila, the last prayer, the fifth prayer. We are sworn to remind ourselves of Jerusalem at times of great happiness. If I forget Jerusalem, Psalm 137. Never is there a greater happiness than the Seder night and on Yom Kippur. At the Seder we rejoice both that we were redeemed from our servitude and that we escaped Egypt's impurity, moral, depra the, the, uh, moral licentiousness. So too at the close of Yom Kippur, it is redemption that causes our joy, redemption from our sins and transgressions. For God has cleansed us of all of them. And in reality, the joy that flows from the sanctity of the Seder night is greater than that which comes from Yom Kippur. For in Yom Kippur, we attain our holy state by forcibly separating ourselves from food and drink and all other needs of the body. Whereas on the Seder night, it is the food and the drink themselves that bring us to the holy state that we reach. It is if we did not merit the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the base on Migdash, the holy temple this year, then we look forward to the next year hoping that then we will be able to partake of the Paschal offering itself in Jerusalem. And so too on Yom Kippur. We hope that the next year we will have a high priest, a Kohen Gadol, who will perform the entire avoda, the service for us in the Holy Temple and in the Holy of Holies. May it be God's will and happen quickly in our time based on the uh, heritage Haggadah. Again, thank you very much. God bless me well. And God willing, next week we'll finish off with the addendum of what some people continue with in the Haggadah with the famous Hadgadya at the end. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.